What's up, scale models and space flight enthusiasts? Welcome to Model Kit Discussion. It's your host, Ray. In today's video, I'll be talking about the Ravel 1 to 144th scale 40th anniversary space shuttle kit with the booster rockets. In this video, I'll be talking about everything I think a scale model should know before building this kit. That being said, it's going to be a pretty long video, so sit back, relax, and prepare for liftoff. Here we go. So, before I start my discussion, I'd like to provide a bit of background information surrounding this kit and the Ravel space shuttle. This kit was released in 2021. 40 years after the first shuttle launch in 1981. However, don't let this recent release date fool you. Ravel first started releasing space shuttles in the late 1970s before the shuttle even flew to space. They made tooling for both a 1 to 144th scale and 1 to 72nd scale space shuttle. Since then, there have been multiple releases of space shuttles from Ravel. As decades have passed, scale modeling has changed and evolved to incorporate greater detail and allow for easier assembly and manufacturers occasionally update old tooling to keep up with modern standards. Ravel, however, hasn't touched their space shuttle tooling since the 1970s, which is rather upsetting to see from a scale monitor's perspective since the space shuttle is arguably one of the hardest vehicles to accurately replicate as a scale model. When Ravel releases a new shuttle, they take the parts from the old tooling, pair it with updated decals, slap a new box on it with a high level of difficulty, and send it out to us scale modelers. Since it's such a difficult vehicle to replicate, you'd expect the manufacturer to put up their end of the effort to help us achieve that goal. Ravel doesn't really do this. As a result, the building process is extremely difficult, and the low quality of the kit makes it even harder to apply accurate fine detailing. It's amazing, all these facilities and you make a piece of crap like this. This doesn't stop us stubborn professional nerds and scale modelers though. Even with an extensive set of accessories in the form of decal sets and replacement parts, this kit is still extremely difficult to build. I'll talk about specifics later. Now for this kit. The box is pretty large as you can see. It's 51 centimeters by 36 centimeters by 8 centimeters. It contains parts to build the orbiter, external tank, boosters, and a mediocre mobile launch platform that serves as a, as a display stand. I chose not to build a mobile launch platform since I was pretty burned out by the time I finished the orbiter, boosters, and the external tank. So instead I have the model resting on a cart made from Lego bricks. As for the markings, this kit includes decals to build the shuttles Enterprise, Columbia, Discovery, Atlantis, and Endeavour in both the pre-1998 marking scheme and post-1998 marking scheme. Why they chose to ignore Challenger, I don't know. I think it's really stupid that they did, but thankfully there's a ton of decal sets out there that provide the markings for Challenger if that's what you want to build. The model is pretty large when completed as well, with a the total dimensions of the stack measuring 39 centimeters tall, 17 centimeters wide, which is the wingspan of the orbiter, and about 16 and a half centimeters from the back of the external tank to the top of the vertical stabilizer. For this build, I built the Space Shuttle Columbia configured for mission STS-107. Since Columbia had a few features that were different to the other orbiters, this kit required some modifications to accurately represent Columbia's unique details. Total time from opening the box to completion was about three months. I took three tries to complete this build, and during the time I wasn't building this kit, I was building other kits. To begin my discussion, I'm going to talk about the building process. The instructions have us build the orbiter first, then the boosters and external tank, so I will talk about each section in that order. So let's talk about the orbiter, starting off with construction. Step one is gluing the two fuselage halves together. Not even through the first step and you're going to be saying, Houston, we have a problem. The fuselage halves are molded crudely, and they lack surface detail. The left side has little cavities on the side of the fuselage to represent the, the side vents. However, the right side is missing these vents, even though they were present on the actual shuttle. I painted black rectangles to represent the open vents. The fuselage halves also fit together very poorly, with most of the sections failing to align properly, forcing us to bend and warp the plastic, or sometimes requiring a great deal of sanding, cutting, and or filling to make the parts look half decent. The rear body flap is also designed to be movable, however with the way it's designed, the flap doesn't even fit into the fuselage correctly without a major overhaul of the attachment points, so I chose to permanently fix mine to the orbiter. The next step is gluing the clear plastic for the cockpit and docking windows. This part is just awful in virtually every way. It doesn't fit snugly with any part of the fuselage and there are significant gaps between the fuselage and the clear plastic. This section required a lot of filler putty and sanding to achieve a somewhat smooth transition between the fuselage and clear plastic, after which the clear plastic was all scratched up. I chose to paint over the plastic with a solid blue since it was too much effort to try and achieve a smooth, 
clear finish with the clear plastic. This kit has no crew cabin interior, so it would have been pretty pointless to have a visible interior in the first place. Moving to the rear of the spacecraft. Attachment of the aft section went the same as the fuselage. Much sanding and filling was needed to seal it properly. The engines are designed to be glued in a fixed position. Thankfully, the attachment of the engines to the rear of the fuselage was relatively easy and simple. The engines have no piping details to represent the extensive plumbing that surrounds the engine bell, so if engine detail is important, you will need to purchase a set of engine bells. Moving up to the ohms pods. These are simply a nightmare to assemble. A lot of cutting and sanding was required to get them to fit to the fuselage properly, and then even more sanding and filling was necessary to fill the gaps left behind. The RCS thrusters are poorly molded and hard to assemble too, and above all, they are missing an RCS thruster on the rear RCS. Note the clear seam lines between the two halves of the RCS sections and the missing RCS thruster from the rear section of the RCS section. By the way, RCS stands for Reaction Control System. This helps to maneuver the spacecraft in space. The Ohm's rockets are pretty mediocre as well. The part closest to the pod is too thick, and it's also difficult to attach them to the pods with the correct angle and positioning. This kit provides no method of alignment for the Ohm's rocket, so it's up to the modeler to eyeball the placement and hope for the best. Since I chose to build Columbia, I needed to modify the vertical stabilizer. The stabilizer for the kit is the original stabilizer without the drag chute used on later missions, and the kit also didn't include any parts to add the silts pod Columbia had. Instead of doing it myself, I ordered a resin tail from Updraft Model Works, which had both the silts pod and the drag chute. I then replaced the original stabilizer. The stabilizer from Updraft is pretty pricey and difficult to remove from its support block, but it's still very high quality, even including indentations for the camera holes in the silts pod. This kit allows for the payload bay to move from open to closed. The payload bay is not accurately detailed, and the included modules are pretty crude and inaccurate. The payload bay doors fit horribly to the kit in the closed position, leaving a gap of 2mm in some places, which is pretty significant for a scale model. The doors didn't close properly, and I had to sand them down multiple times before they fit relatively smoothly with the fuselage. Therefore, I chose to glue mine shut. However, I was not alone in building this kit since fellow space geek Oliver the Space Nerd also built this kit at the same time as me, and ironically he also built Columbia. He managed to work the payload bay to open and close on his kit, and here's what his looks like. Note the silver radiator panels and the clearly defined support points. These are extremely hard to remove and require extensive sanding to get rid of. A lot of the parts in this kit, not only the payload bay, share similar problems. Even with these issues, Oliver the Space Nerd did a pretty solid job working on the payload bay on his kit, so well done buddy. The wings were a bit easier to work with since they fit together mostly well. The wings have some raised panel line detail, however this panel line detail configuration was only ever used on Columbia and Challenger, so in order to accurately replicate the wing details for the other orbiters, you would need to sand these details off and purchase a decal set representing the correct configuration. Fitting the wings to the fuselage was a bit hard as well, since large gaps were left behind on the underside which required filling. The top side had a much better fit and did not require filling. Notice the smooth transition from the wing to the fuselage from this view of the top of the wing. Here's a view of the bottom of the spacecraft. Notice the clearly defined wing joints. I tried to fill these, but Obviously, I didn't have much success, and there is still a very clear definition between where the wing starts and the fuselage starts. The underside of the spacecraft is pretty bare. There's no tile details, which is understandable as that would be extremely difficult to replicate. This kit includes parts for extended landing gear. However, I chose mine to have the landing gear in the retracted position since the orbiter was going to attach to the boosters and the external tank. The gear covers barely fit into the slats for the gear, and like the wings, they too required a lot of filling and sanding to seal the gaps. Notice the clearly defined areas where the gear covers are. Even with a bit better filling than the wings, the gaps are still clearly defined. After assembly, painting was mostly straightforward. Still, I had quite a few difficulties. Since there are no raised or molded details at the front part of the orbiter, the modeler has nothing to use for reference for the proper alignment of the black and white thermal protection system at the front of the spacecraft. 
The instructions provide a chart of measurements which, for which sections to paint black and white, but this is still extremely difficult to work with since there are many angled parts. They didn't make this a maximum difficulty kit for no reason. After that, painting is pretty simple and straightforward. At the front of the spacecraft, there are a lot of decals to help in replicating the RCS and heat shield areas. The ones I had the most difficulty with were the larger decals for the cockpit windows, forward RCS, and crew access hatch. The cockpit and RCS decals are split in half. One part goes on the left side and the other part goes to the right. Getting these exactly aligned is hard, but not impossible. Patience and care is required in order to achieve the proper alignment without damaging the decals. I didn't get the best alignment with the cockpit window decals, as you can see with this small section of white poking through. You can also see some of the unfilled gap left behind from assembly under the decal. There are also decals for the star trackers and docking windows. These are a bit easier to work with in position, but you have to eyeball the placement for the star tracker decals since there is absolutely no reference points for them. Notice the large indentations around the docking windows from the large gaps left behind from assembly. An unexpected decal is the black decal behind the RCC nose cone. This decal helps create the correct shape for the nose cone, which came in handy. It was difficult to apply and fit to the curved nose shape, but after a few layers of decal softener, the, the decal went on smoothly. The decals for the fuselage are decent as well. The only decal I had trouble with was the decal for the payload bay hinges. I clearly did something wrong with it since it has this ugly reflective finish that I can't get rid of no matter how many coats and treatments I try with it. Aligning this with the sanded payload bay doors was damn near impossible as well. I was at fault for that issue because I chose to seal the doors with filler. Another thing with the door hinge decals was this gray square that was strangely part of the decal. I didn't cut it off on either side and it ended up poking out from under the United States titles, so that was irritating to deal with. Here on the left side, there are also some decals for the smaller parts. These fit well and were relatively easy to apply. Same deal with the right side. Notice how on some of the decals near the front of the fuselage, there's a black outline around them. This is the result of my incompetence with weathering the crew cabin and the wings to create a darker area for where the white tiles remained. Notice the issue with the hinge decal and the United States title here too. On this side, you can also see where I had trouble filling the payload bay gaps with the inconsistencies of the finish on the fuselage and the color of the paint. Moving to the ohms pod and rear section, decals here were mostly straightforward except for the black thermal protection on the ohms pods. These did not fit well, and the instructions don't do a good job of explaining how to fit them properly and where. The gaps between the ohms pod and the fuselage don't help either. After a ton of decals off, I was able to get the decal to fit somewhat smoothly to the surface. The vertical stabilizer was relatively smooth compared to the rest of the spacecraft. Even with the aftermarket stabilizer, the decals fit just fine. Due to the different thermal protection system configuration with the silts pod, I had to cut the decal for the black thermal protection system on the leading edge of the stabilizer. Aside from that, everything fit pretty good. The instructions instruct to paint the entire rudder black and then place white decals over the black paint. I was originally skeptical of how the white would differ from the painted white to the white on the decal with the black paint under it. Thankfully, the decals on this kit are incredibly thick, so there is almost no difference. The decals on the wings are pretty interesting. The instructions have the modeler paint the elevons entirely black, and then the decals for the white surfaces are provided with the kit. Same story as the vertical stabilizer, these went well with the paint. The white metallic panels forward of the elevons also went on smoothly. This kit includes the configuration for both the early metal panels and the late panels. For some reason though, the black metal panels from the early orbiter design are gray on the decals. I see a lot of modelers painting these clearly black decals gray too, which I don't understand. Only the orbiter Enterprise had these decals painted gray. The rest of the orbiters had them clearly black. Anywho, the wings have some black thermal protection decals which sit aft of the RCC panels. These fit very well too. Notice the gray weathering and the raised panel line detail that I shared earlier. Here's the left wing. The NASA meatball logo is a nice dark blue, but it's too dark when compared to the real logo. The design is also rather questionable with a few parts being misaligned. These issues are even worse on the meatball logos for the fuselage. 
still they play their part so i think it's good enough thank you for attending my ted talk about the orbiter now for the tank and boosters this section shouldn't be nearly as long as the orbiter section assembling the boosters on this kit is a pretty easy process though the boosters share similar fitting issues to the orbiter they aren't as hard to deal with though the boosters are designed to separate from the external tank, which is pretty convenient for storage and moving this thing around. The attachment is extremely sturdy as well. I will be using the left SRB to discuss the building process. Aside from the fitting problems with the booster itself, it's very simple and easy to assemble. Attaching the joints is a little hard, but it's not impossible. The ejection thrusters are a separate part from the boosters and need to be attached. There is an engraved rectangle outlining the location of where it should be attached, however this rectangle is too far inwards and I ended up missing this and attaching the ejection thrusters in the wrong spot. Even if I were to fit them to the right spot, it would be pretty hard to modify the ejection thrusters to fit in this part of the booster. Painting the booster was simple, the only hard part was the grey ring on the joint section which was exclusive to STS-107 at the time of its launch. You can see a few inconsistencies in the paint application but overall I think it went well. The real challenge is the rings. These rings are decals which are incredibly hard to align properly. The red ring here is on the angled part of the booster which made it impossible to fit the decal properly so I had to paint it by hand instead. I also got unlucky with the matte coat that I put on the boosters since it messed up the decals pretty hard as you can see with these curves and depressions that are supposed to be straight lines. Moving up the booster. There are no decals to replicate the loaded letters usually seen on the boosters, so that's kind of a bummer. There are also decals for the black rectangles on the lower sections of the boosters, which were used on earlier missions, but not the black rectangular patterns on the nose cone of the boosters also seen in earlier missions. The white maintenance panel decal is difficult to apply as well, since there is nothing to reference its exact position, so the modeler needs to eyeball the placement and hope for the best. This is particularly hard on the right SRB, which doesn't have a black ring nearby to use as a reference. The maintenance panel isn't even the right shape either. Here is the white maintenance panel I'm referring to, by the way. As for the nose cones, the ejection rocket holes engraved into the nose cones do not align with the decals, so placing the decals is annoying. These black circles here also don't have any places of alignment to reference off of so we again have to eyeball and guess where they go. I didn't do the best job with placing them. There are six total, so you can check their symmetry from the top. Here is a rough idea of what the symmetry should look like. Notice how the alignment isn't the best, especially with the top and bottom ones with the rest of the circles on the booster. Or are these even holes? I'm not even sure what they are. Holes, circles, you name it. The external tank was also much easier to build than the orbiter. It too had fitting and alignment issues which were mostly solved with sanding and putty filling. Note the clearly defined seam line of the two halves that you can't even see. Hold on. Alright, here's a view that you can see that seam line that I'm referring to. Sorry about that. Thankfully, the tank does not have any decals to apply. However, its faults come in the details it has. The tank is modeled after the early external tank. So if the modeler wants to build a later mission stack like me, there's a few inaccuracies that have to be tolerated or removed. Namely, this pipe here was present for early missions, but by STS-107 it was gone. There are also a lot of clamp-like structures featured to hold the pipes which are missing as well. In order to create an accurate external tank, a lot of modification is required. Too much modification for me, hence why I didn't add or remove anything. The attachment points are modeled nicely, exactly aligning them to the to fit to the orbiter is a bit difficult, but it's doable with patience and a combination of slow setting and quick setting glue. I'm just going to show you around the external tank really quick because I really don't have much commentary to provide. So here's the rear uh, section here. It's uh, pretty nicely detailed, kind of hard to paint, especially with all the different orange colors. There's three different orange colors that go onto this external tank. There's the bright one that you see here and the pipes and parts of the um, support structures here. There's obviously the gray for the pipes and then the two other ones, uh, well the other ones are this lighter, this darker orange and then the very dark orange that fits on the external tank itself. 
Yeah, here's that bipod. And here's the nose cone, if you were curious. Yeah, I'm completely improvising this section, by the way. I've been reading from a script almost this entire time, so I have no idea what to say. <laughs> wow, that was a lot of talking. In short, this kit is well past its glory days. If it ever had them, that is. It's extremely arduous and difficult to build accurately, even with accessories and replacement parts available these days. I've seen multiple decal sets for tile patterns and thermal protection system markings and additional markings for the different shuttle yards. Updraft Model Works also offers a decent set of high quality parts for this kit and the 1 over 70 second scale kit as well, so go check them out if you're building this kit. There are also plenty of other good accessories out there as well. If you want to build a scale model space shuttle, I recommend staying away from this kit unless you have a lot of modeling ex experience. This kit requires a great deal of time, patience, modification, and precision to build accurately. Having the proper supplies is an absolute must. You definitely need experience with filler putty as well. Based on a bit of internet surfing, I found that the Airfix shuttle kit is a bit better than this one, but it too has its faults. Overall, the shuttle in 1 to 144th scale isn't really replicated that well across the board based on what I've seen. If you are watching and you would like to share your own opinions about this kit or your experience with other kits, please do. I'd love to hear from your experience and I'm sure other modelers would find your information useful. If you're looking for a good shuttle kit, I recommend the Hasegawa 1 to 200 scale space shuttles. I've built three of them in the same amount of time it took me to build this kit and they are much easier and simpler to work with, though they don't have as many accessories and add-on parts as other scales, so modification is more dependent on the modeler. They are also much more shelf-friendly and affordable. If you're slightly insane and you want to build a larger shuttle, you can try Tamiya's 1 to 100 scale space shuttle. I know little about that one, but I've read that it's a decent kit. I've even seen someone go as far as to say it's the best space shuttle kit out there, even though the competition doesn't have as much to offer. If you're a professional nerd and or seriously unstable, like me, you can try one of the huge 1 to 70 second scale kits. As far as I know, only Ravel and Monogram have made them, and those are both old toolings like this kit, and require a serious amount of dedication like this kit. I had such a tough experience with this kit from Ravel that I followed a logical thought process and decided to get the 1 to 70 second scale kit from Ravel as well. I seriously need to rethink my decisions. Anyway, that's all I've got for you guys. Thanks for watching this absurdly long video. I hope you found something useful out of it. And if you have any questions for me and or other modelers, let us know down in the comments. I'll be happy to give you some advice and I'm sure other modelers would like to do the same. If you have tips and tricks, please share those. Those are incredibly useful for those of us who are building these things. And yeah, I'd greatly appreciate the feedback and your time. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more aerospace and scale modeling content. And most importantly, take care of yourselves and have fun building. Like, comment, and subscribe. See you later.